Please pray with me. Gracious God, may the meditations of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be a pleasing offering to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now, I know when you saw that text that was written out that this biblical passage is everybody's favorite. And if you're familiar with the King James, which I know some of you are probably missing this morning, you might remember all those begats that show up in these verses in that translation. This is the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, and it is riveting reading. And it doesn't get more exciting than that. But seriously, not usually anybody's favorite passage and many of you might be wondering, why the heck are we hearing this passage? As I was reading it, I found myself wondering that too. But you know, it sure beats what the Revised Common Lectionary has designated for this Sunday. And that's when King Herod slaughters every baby in Bethlehem. So, I mean, it beats that. Although some of you might be thinking, eh, maybe... But this is the opening of the Gospel of Matthew, and it contains some important information that the writer of the Gospel wants us to know. Now, the opening is described as an account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. And now that's a decent translation of the Greek, but it obscures something that the first century CE audience would have picked up on that we don't. See, most Jews in the first century would have been familiar with the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible called the Septuagint. There will be a quiz later. And the writer of Matthew is purposely echoing language from that text, from the Septuagint. A more liberal reading of, this, of that particular phrase would be the book of the generation of Jesus the Messiah, the book of the generations of Jesus the Messiah, which some of you might think, wait, those words sound vaguely familiar. And that's because that matches Genesis 2, verse 4, which says the book of the generations of heaven and earth. And again, in Genesis 5, 1, where it gives that table of the nations, it says the book of the generations of humankind. And not only that, the word that was translated in our Bibles as generations is genesis in Greek. So there's yet another connection there. The writer of Matthew wants us to immediately connect this genealogy with the book of Genesis and the beginning of the Torah, which is the, five, the first five books of the Bible. And then we have this genealogy itself. It's organized around the number 14. 14 generations from Abraham to King David. 14 generations from David to the Babylonian exile, and all of those are kings that are listed there. And 14 generations from the Babylonian exile to the coming of Jesus. Now, 14 times 3 is 42. If you get out your little pencils and count how many names. You'll notice there's only 41. Now scholars have all sorts of theories about as to why there's a missing name. I'll just leave that for you guys to have fun with later. Now, needless to say, lots of people had to be removed to make all three sets equal to 14. There were several kings of Judah who were just left out. But you see, 14 is a special number. Seven you know, is a number that symbolizes completeness and perfection, and 14 is 2 times 7. Now, you also need to know that Hebrew does not have special symbols for numbers. They don't have numerals like we do. Instead, in Hebrew, they use letters to represent numbers. So, A is 1, B is 2, C is 3, except with Hebrew letters, all of Beit, Gimel, Dalit, you know, etc. You know those numbers, those letters. So as a result, and this is a really interesting feature of the Hebrew, it's also true of some other ancient languages, but every word actually also is a number, which is really interesting to think about. Any word in Hebrew can also be a number. And it just so turns out that the name David, David in Hebrew, also has a number. Can you guess what number that probably is? 
14, exactly, exactly. D is four and V is six. So you get 14, yeah. So we get to the point of what this genealogy is really about. It is a focus on David, King David. This particular genealogy is not making any historical claims, but theological and even political ones. It's emphasizing an understanding of Jesus that sees him as the rightful heir to King David. And it's also introduced in a way that ties it in with the book of Genesis. God's promise to Abraham to bless all the nations of the earth through Abraham. And not only that, scholars have noticed that the Gospel of Matthew groups Jesus' teachings into five big chunks. Five big chunks. Five things. What are five things in the Bible? What does that make you think of? Well, the five books of Moses, the Torah. So Matthew, the, the Gospel of Matthew, is connecting not just with Genesis and Abraham, but really the first five books of the Bible. So Jesus is connected with David, with the Torah, and the Torah is connected with the Gospel of Matthew. So Jesus is the new David, and the Gospel of Matthew is the new Torah. Now what does that have to do with us? What are we going on here for? Chris, this is all well and good, but what does this have to do with us? And that is a great question. Let's see if I can kind of help unpack this a little bit. As I mentioned, the genealogy of ties Jesus in with Abraham, with the Torah, and with King David. And this connection with the Hebrew Bible affirms that God is renewing creation according to God's promises way back then. The saving God from the past is the saving God of the present and, by inference, will be the saving God of the future, who has come to us in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. The promises of God can be trusted. This new age, the kingdom of God, is a time of fulfillment of God's promises. And through Jesus, God is acting to redeem not just individuals, but all of creation. We can rely on those promises, knowing that God is working to redeem our world, even today. And connecting Jesus with David also emphasizes Jesus' role as a king. He's God's chosen ruler in the line of David. All those promises to David are fulfilled in Jesus. But he's not the same kind of king as David. He's not going to murder a man to marry his wife. He's not going to let his personal problems tear his kingdom apart. And the connection with Abraham reminds us that that connection is to all the peoples of the earth. Jesus is the king who will reign with an eye to all the people of the earth. Jesus comes to bless all the people and renew this true kingdom which belongs to God and not Caesar. It reminds us that our nations today are only relative and temporary. The kingdom of God exists for the benefit of all, and the kingdom of God is where our ultimate allegiance lies. Because no matter our language, our nationality, our continent, or culture, all people of the world are one nation in the kingdom of God. Another interesting piece about this is that genealogies usually emphasize patriarchy. They list the forefathers of the person in question. But you may have noticed you were able to hear the words without rolling your eyes around in your head or glazing over, you may have noticed that this genealogy is a little different, in fact, a bit strange. Because this genealogy mentions five women. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and of course, Mary. And these are not the famous women that you would expect to be in the genealogy. There's no Sarah, 
wife of Abraham. There's no Rebecca, wife of Isaac. There's no Leah, wife of Jacob. Not the great mothers of the nation. Instead, it's these five women. All five of these women who are mentioned have something questionable about them. There's Tamar, who I can't really think of a G-rated way to describe Tamar's story. So I'm going to have to encourage you to read Genesis 38 to find it out yourself. And then there's Rahab, who was a prostitute in Jericho, who helped the Israelite spies. And then there's Ruth, the Moabite woman who married Boaz through a rather unconventional courtship, to say the least. And then we have Bathsheba, who even here in this genealogy is purposely referred to as the wife of Uriah the Hittite. She was the beautiful woman that King David took for himself after having her husband killed. And then we have Mary, the engaged woman who wasn't living with her husband yet and somehow becomes pregnant under circumstances that most people would have considered suspicious. These are women that would normally be left out of a genealogy because there's something questionable about them. In fact, one of my professors in seminary actually wrote a book called The Prostitute in the Family Tree, and he was talking about this very thing. Normally, those aren't the people that you put in your family tree. After all, you have the daughter-in-law who impersonates a prostitute. You have an actual prostitute. You have a foreign woman who propositions a man to get him to marry her, and a woman a man kills to obtain and marry. These are the five women in here. What's going on? It demonstrates to us that God's kingdom includes people that others might exclude. It also shows that through these odd folks, these women, God is at work in the world. And it doesn't matter who you are, because God can and will act through you. It reminds us to not be so judgmental, since we don't really know exactly what God is working at in time and how it's happening. So we can live secure in the knowledge that God's promise of redemption will be fulfilled. And that frees us to live the kind of lives that God would have us live. Lives of generosity and piety. Lives that work for needs of those who are most vulnerable. Contributing our time and our talents and our treasure to the mission of God in this world. Including Bethany. Voting for candidates who support Jesus' mission for the needy. Writing letters and emails to leaders to encourage them to do the right thing. And when needed, demonstrating for causes that serve God's aims in this world. And we are called to live in a wider community than our own town, county, state, or even country. We are called to be citizens of the kingdom of God, and our obligations extend to the ends of the earth and to all people. Now, some of these, those things I mentioned above also apply here. Our time, talents, and treasures can, can go to the wider work of the kingdom. And voting and writing letters and demonstrating for causes beyond the borders of our immediate communities. And lastly, we can be confident that no matter our real or imagined faults, God will use us to accomplish God's purposes. That realization can spur us on as we work to serve God's mission in this world. Because no matter who we are or where we are in life's journey, not only are we welcome here in the United Church of Christ, but we are also able to be used by God to complete God's mission. Every person needs to feel like they matter. And that's what God is doing here through this genealogy and through the person of Jesus Christ. And that's what the church needs to do over and over again. Remind individuals that they matter, no matter who they are, no matter how small or how great, no matter weak or how strong. Each and every person matters, and what they do matters. 
and that God can use each and every person to accomplish amazing deeds. Because God has been at work, continues to be at work, and will forever be at work in this world, which God loves so dearly. There is nothing that the forces of death and sin can do to prevent God's work. Whether we're a prostitute or a saint, a hero or an ordinary person, God can and does work through us to accomplish God's goals. And that realization affirms our worth and encourages us to do bigger and better things for God's kingdom, which is for all people everywhere. And to that end, we declare our allegiance. And to that end, we commit 